Shall we pray together? Our Heavenly Father, when we were sinners and when we were on the way to eternal hell, you sent your only Son Jesus Christ to save us. And Jesus shed all of his blood on the cross and he said, It is finished. And we know all of our sins were washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. So thank you so much for your grace. And thank you so much for giving us new life. And you gave us the Holy Spirit so that we can be guided in our Christian life. And Lord, we are here to listen to your word today. Encourage us and empower us through your word so that we can live a faithful Christian life until Jesus comes again. And the pandemic is spreading so quickly and even some brothers and sisters are also they got infected. But Lord, please protect all the brothers and sisters and the church so that we can gather together and we can worship you together uh, safely. Uh, from the beginning to the end, I commit the rest of time unto your mighty hand. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, let us turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 8. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 8. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 to 8. Let, let's read it together. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from, above, from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather, be, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. There are two enemies which the humans cannot conquer with their own power is uh, sin and death and sin and death is something we cannot really um, destroy by ourselves uh, I'm reading a book by um, there's a one very prominent scholar in Korea named Lee Oryong and uh, he's uh, well over 80s and now he's uh, dying with cancer and this book is about the, the interview, the last interview you know, before he dies and then there I can see even this great scholar you know, and he, ha he was a minister of the, um, the cultural minister of Korea one time and he was a professor and he is very famous he's the one who, uh, who uh, managed the opening ceremony of uh, 1988 Olympic Games. Uh, he's the one who directed the whole show. But in his last interview, I can see again and again he feels very powerless because he knows that the death is coming near. And uh, even though he claims he's a Christian, uh, he's not so sure what will happen after he dies, actually. You know? And I believe that he doesn't really trust the Bible. Uh, as we do, because uh, some stories in the Bible, he say it doesn't make sense, you know, like because he cannot understand that part. Anyway, the death is uh, is coming to everyone, but you know, except those who are truly born again, people are not ready to face the death. There's one. Uh, scholar Elizabeth Quibler Ross who uh, studied the death for the first time 
So he uh, start, started this uh, study of death. And she said, uh, you know, when people come to know that they would die soon, first they deny it and then they become angry and then later, you know, finally they accept that fact. So he, she uh, said that there are five stages when people face the death. The interesting story is uh, this Ross, uh, Elizabeth Ross, who studied death so much, when she got cancer and she was dying, um, she was overwhelmed by the death, actually. She was uh, really depressed. So people asked her, you know, you saw so many people dying and you studied death and you encouraged many people and get people ready to uh, face the death. So why, uh, why you are angry with your death coming? And she said, well, so far I was talking about the death of others. The death was the tiger in a cage, in a zoo. You know, others' death was in a cage. So she could observe it and she could uh, study it. But now that the tiger is uh, out of the uh, out of the cage and uh, charging at me the tiger is coming after me right uh, this is totally different story so I can see you know even that uh, Elizabeth Rose who studied death uh, and she is an expert in death she's afraid of death and she says that it's like a tiger out of cage I cannot handle it you know, I thought I could handle but no this is totally different story all the achievement of humans the science and technology and all this uh, you know the studies and research cannot overcome the death that's the fact and today the part we just read, the passage we just read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, this is about how Apostle Paul view the death. What is death to him? Right? So, we can see, uh, even as Christians, how, what we should think about death. What is death for us, for us born again Christians? So that that is what we will cover today. Verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. This is good news, right? Apostle Paul says in this um, scripture, our body we are living in is a tent, earthly home, earthly house. That means that uh, this body is our, where our spirit dwells while we are living in this earth, right? And it's a temporary, it's a tent. It's not permanent one, right? And if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, what does that mean? This tent is not permanent. It's not for forever. It will be destroyed. Of course, we know that, you know, people live 70 years or 80 years when they are strong, even sometimes 100 years, but they all die. This body, this tent, will be destroyed for surely, right? That is the, um, what the Bible tells us again and again. Let's bookmark here and let's turn to Job chapter 4. Job chapter 4, verse 19 and 20. Job chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. Job, right before Psalm. Job chapter 4, verse 19 and 20. Let's read it together. How much more those who dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, who are crushed before a moth. They are broken in pieces from morning till evening. They perish forever with no one regarding we are living in houses of clay and our foundation is in the dust because we came from the dust we'll go back to the dust remember 
right? Who are crushed before a moth, small insect, moth. You know, we are so vulnerable. We are so fragile. They are broken in pieces from morning till evening. You know, like a clay jar is broken. You know, we will be destroyed. Verse 21, uh, does not their own excellence go away? They die even without wisdom. In another version, NASB, it says, Is not their tent cord plucked up within them? I think this is better translation. Their tent cord, uh, for to place the tent, to build a tent, you have a cord which is support the tent. But it will be, the, the tent cords will be plucked out and the tent collapse. That's what will happen, right? Look at your body. Maybe you are young, so you feel you are strong and you are healthy, but as you grow old, older, what happens is uh, you feel that you, know, you become tired easily and then some part of the body is not functioning well. You have some sickness, disease, and then some part you feel uncomfortable. You know. For me, like I have a diabetes, so I have to take a medicine, I have to do exercise all the time, and then even though there are really nice food, I cannot take them because uh, the sugar level will go up so high when I take these um, the sugars. So anyway, this earthly house, this tent will be destroyed. And we know one thing, God our Father who wants the best for us, already He prepared the, the best building for us. For us, let's go to Second Corinthians chapter five, verse one. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building, building from God. You know, we have a building from God. This building means that that's the um, eternal and glorious body we will put on at the time of resurrection, or even for us. Luckily and fortunately, we will wear, put on that glorious body at the time of rapture, right? You know rapture, when Jesus comes again, will be caught up to heaven and that time our body will be changed into glorious body. Of course, the Christian who died before, their body will be also changed. They, they, will, they will be resurrected and the body they will put on is the same glorious body and that is the uh, the good news really good news jesus conquered sin and death that's our hope actually right uh let's turn to first corinthians chapter 15. i will talk more about this uh, glorious body what it is like uh first corinthians chapter 15 Verse 42, 42, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 42. And you know this uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is about resurrection. And sometimes um, now you better read the whole chapter to see what, what is ahead of us, what will happen to us uh, you know, at the time of resurrection. So, verse 42, so also the resurrection of the dead, the body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Our body is corruptible, but the body we will wear, the, the body we will have in the, at the time of resurrection, that is incorruptible. Verse 43, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. So you know, this eternal building will put on it is glorious it is powerful right it's, it would not be like this body this body is uh, just like a tent you know you know tent is a temporary suppose you have a tent maybe it looks nice in the beginning but suppose you are living there for 40 years 50 years 60 years what would happen to tent some part is torn you know some part is uh, worn out and uh, some part is, uh, you know, some support is broken. It's, 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 it's collapsing, actually, right? But 
the body will have at the time of resurrection or at the time of rapture for us is uh, glorious and powerful. Verse 44, it is sown in our natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. The body we'll have later is a spiritual body. This, do you remember Jesus when after resurrection? He came through the world when the, the disciples locked the door because they were so afraid of the Roman soldiers. Jesus just came through the world. So that body, the spiritual body, right? It's not like a natural body. Verse 45, so it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the, spirit, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward, the spiritual. Uh, verse 47 to 49, uh, 47 to 49, three verses. Let's read it together. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Are you born again? Yes. That means that you, know, you have received the new life from heaven. Your spirit was dead, but now your spirit is born again. It's alive, right? And for those whose spirit is born again, the new body, the glorious body, spiritual body, incorruptible and powerful body is waiting for you. And verse 49, we have borne the image of the man of dust. Of course, in this world, you know, we have this um, body, physical body, uh, which is from Adam, first man, but at the time of resurrection, we'll have this spiritual body. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly man, Jesus Christ. We will be like a Jesus, actually, right? When Jesus was in this world, one time he showed what will happen to him after resurrection, actually. Uh, we call it the transfiguration. Right? His body changed, was transfigured. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 17. You can see you know, what Jesus would be like after resurrection from this um, happening. Uh, Matthew chapter 17, verse 1 and 2. Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. Let's read it together. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them on up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Suddenly, Jesus was transfigured. He was shining like the sun. And his clothes became as white as the light. So bright. So white. Uh, let's talk to Mark. Chapter 9, Mark says, uh, Mark, Mark, Mark has a little bit more information. Mark chapter 9, verse 23, or, or similar, but a little bit different. Uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 2 and 3. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining exceedingly white, white like a snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. There's no such white clothes. It's shining, basically. You know? How glorious. Whenever you read passage like this, this scripture should give you hope. Why? Because we will be like him someday. Whatever Jesus has become here, like uh, shining and then wearing this white clothes, that's what will happen to you and me. This earthly body, earthly tent will be gone. And we will receive heavenly and eternal building from God. And that is the hope 
for us. Let's go back to First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, chapter five. For we know, chapter five, verse one. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God. We know. How do we know? Because we believe whatever God promised in the Bible that will happen to us. We know. We know that the glorious body is prepared for us. And that's why, verse 2, this is what Apostle Paul says. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. Suppose you really know that the glorious body is waiting for you. Then, of course, you will really desire to be clothed with that glorious body. This was the hope of Apostle Paul. He says, in this we groan, right? I believe what God has prepared for us is beyond our imagination. We cannot even imagine how good the heaven will be, how, how excellent that the spiritual body will put on will be. We have no idea. First Corinthians chapter two, verse nine. Let me read First Corinthians chapter two, verse nine. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Look at look around, you know. Whatever we see is what God prepared for us so that we can uh, live in this world. Like the sky and the, the mountains and the trees and birds, animals, whatever we, we see and we enjoy is from God. And what about in heaven? The heaven is the place for God's own children. Right? And if you become a parent, you want to provide everything for your child actually. You know, you want to uh, provide, you want to prepare the best clothes and the best shoes and then the crib and then room and then you, you decorate the whole room for your uh, baby who will be born, right? Because you want to give the best for your child. You want the best for your child always, right? And what about God? The same. And that's why the things which God has prepared for those who love Him, that's beyond our imagination. By the way, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Apostle Paul said, he went up to the third heaven where God dwells, actually. He experienced it. That's how he knows, actually, how glorious this uh, our new body will be because he saw what heaven is like. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 to 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 to 4. Let me read. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into the paradise and heard inexpressible words, which, is, which it is not lawful for man to utter. He's talking about himself. But he says, uh, I know a man in verse 2. He doesn't know whether he was in the body or out of the body because that experience was so amazing. Right? But he was caught up to the third heaven. The first heaven is the sky where the birds fly. The second heaven is where the stars are. The third heaven is the God's dwelling place. And he saw that, right? And of course, because he saw what heaven was like, he was always saying that, 
oh, I want to join my Lord Jesus Christ. That's natural. Right? You'll say like that too, right? No. I know some, someone who travel in a very nice place. Uh, he always says, uh, I want to go there again. I want to visit there again because he knows how good it is. Right? Listen to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 verse 23. Philippians chapter 1 verse 23. Let me read. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. He is hard pressed between the two. The two means living in this world and ministering to God, preaching the gospel. And the other one is you know, joining the Lord in heaven. And he says, uh, if I depart and if I'm with Christ, which is far better, that is much better, of course. What about you? You want to join heaven? And you want to see Jesus face to face? And you want to enjoy everything God has prepared for you? Or you don't even think about what God prepare for you and you just uh, enjoy the things in this world you say Jesus please come later I know I haven't experienced everything I haven't enjoyed much things in this world like uh, your heart is up above or down here listen to Psalm number 42 Psalm number 42 verse 2 Psalm number 42 Verse 2. Let's read it together. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? When? When can I see my God? My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. I know God loves me and I know God God is good and you know he is the one who created me and he is the one who gave me life and who, he is the one who is waiting for me in heaven I want to see him as soon as possible is it just for us the born again Christians who is longing to see God we are the only one who is longing to see God no even the nature, all the creatures, they are, they are groaning too. They are longing to see God too. Listen to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 2. Romans chapter 8, verse 20, sorry. Verse 20 to 23. Romans Chapter 8, verse 20 to 23. Let's read it together. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. The whole creation groans together because they are in the bondage of corruption now. Not willingly, because of the sin of Adam. The whole creation, whole creature is in bondage and they are groaning and they are waiting for the adoption what's the adoption the redemption of our body the redemption of our body you know that there are three stages of salvation the so salvation of our spirit which is the you know the salvation we talk all the time like a uh, born again salvation and the second salvation is uh, our life changes and the third one is uh, also called the glorification which means that our body will be glorified and then will be transformed into glorious body verse 23 not only that but we also who have the first fruits of the spirit 
even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting, eagerly, with the whole heart, we are waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Do you? Are you waiting for this adoption? Are you waiting for the second, second coming Jesus? Apostle Paul did. And let's go back to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 3. Verse 3. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. What is this glorious body is important because this is what happens. Suppose, you know, we know that our earthly, this body, this tent will be destroyed. And if no, uh, nothing has been prepared for our spirit, we'll be naked. Okay? Those who are not truly born again, they will stand before God naked. That's the truth. They will have no nothing to cover them. Uh, let's turn to Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. After Adam sinned, when God was searching for him, this is what he said. Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. Let me read. And Adam called, oh, sorry, uh, chapter 3, verse 10. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. Let me read. So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Right after Adam sinned, he found he was naked. He was uh, ashamed of himself and he was hiding and he was afraid of God. Shame and fear are the result of sin. Always shame and fear. Okay? And when those who are not born again stand before God, they'll find that they will stand naked before God. Hebrew chapter 4, Hebrew chapter 4, verse 13. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. Let me read. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. This is about this, um, you know, those who are not born again, those who are not saved, those who are not, those who are not trusting Jesus Christ. No. Sinners, they'll be afraid, just like uh, Adam. I'm naked, I'm afraid. That's why I'm hiding myself. But remember, this time, when all the sinners stand before God, there's no place to hide. What about us? We'll stand before God after we die with the garments of salvation on our body. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 10 let's read it together I will greatly rejoice in the Lord my soul shall be joyful in my God for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation he has covered me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with the ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. What is the garments of salvation? The blood of Jesus Christ covered all our sin. And now, we will be clothed in this beautiful garment. Okay? And death is the only way to stand before God. Without this garment, you will be naked. Okay? For all the people in this world, the most important question is, are you naked or are you 
clothed? Do you have these garments of salvation on or not? That is the question. Because let's turn to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. Jesus made it clear. You know, in Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ said. Let me read. Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Without this garments of salvation, we'll be so ashamed you know, and you will be afraid because the judgment is coming for you. The garments of salvation will cover all of your sins and then you know God doesn't even remember your sin he cannot see your sins is covered with the blood of Jesus Christ blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments you know, that's the only difference are you naked or not do you have these garments of salvation or not in Matthew chapter 22, there's a story about king uh, throwing a party for his son's wedding and then he invited so many, but those who were invited didn't come. So he, he told his servant to go to the highways and then invite anyone they see. So so many came to this feast, but there's uh, one man who was not wearing this uh, special clothes for the guest, right? Matthew chapter 22 Matthew chapter 22 verse 11 Matthew chapter 22 verse 11 to 13 Let's read it together But when the king came in to see the guest he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment So he said to him Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know what happened? When you are invited to king's feast, it's the custom that the king provides the, the garment for you. In this case, wedding garment. Okay? You don't have to prepare for yourself because uh, you know there are many people many kinds of people poor people rich people but the king didn't want to see the poor people wearing the uh, you know this uh, like a not so good clothes so the king provides these wedding garments for his guest this one this man uh, the one who did not have on a wedding garment maybe he thought like this Oh, I don't like that wedding garment. Mine is better, you know. I like my clothes, you know. So I just, I just, he just ignored this wedding garment, okay? We are born again, and we have this wedding garments from God, because God is the one who provides everything for us. Do you know why salvation is free? Because there's nothing we can do for our salvation. And we cannot even afford this wedding garment. So we are wondering, can I go to the feast or not? Maybe that's why these people didn't come in the first place. But, you know, by the grace of the king, he prepared everything. They could just walk in and then put on this wedding garment and then enjoy everything, the feast. Isn't it just like our salvation, you know? We were wondering, can he, can he really join heaven, the beautiful place, the glorious place? Am I worthy to join heaven? God says, don't worry, I prepared everything. But there are some people who says that, you know, God, I don't need salvation. I think I'm good enough. You know? I don't need this garment you prepare for me. What the king said is, verse 13, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
this is about hell, right? We will never be found naked before God because of our salvation. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4. Uh, second Corinthians, let's go back to Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 4. For we who are in this tent grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. I, I hope you understand this scripture clearly. We who are in this tent grown, even though we are saved, we means those who are saved. Even though we are God's children, we groan, being burdened. You know why? Why we are groan, groaning and we feel we are burdened. At the time of salvation, when we believed that Jesus took away all our sins and died on the cross, and he, when he said, it is finished, that time we know all our sins were gone. But the fact is, we still have this sinful nature. So don't be confused. What Jesus did on the cross, what Jesus achieved on the cross is, He paid for all our sins till we die. Our past sin, future, present sin, future sins were all forgiven. That's the fact. Because Jesus paid everything for our sins. All the sins we will commit in our lifetime. That's okay. But another thing is that even though our sins are forgiven legally and God doesn't even remember our sins, but we still have this sinful nature in our body. And that sinful nature will be with you until you die, until, you, until this earthly tent is destroyed. That's the fact. That's why we are groaning. We are not becoming angel right after salvation. We are not perfect either. We still have this sinful nature committing sin from time to time. Of course, not always, because we are, uh, we are imitating Jesus Christ and this is a whole different subject, but according to Romans chapter 8, we have the Holy Spirit who helps us to overcome sin and we are becoming godlier and godlier. But still, we are burdened because from time to time we can feel the presence of sinful nature. And that's why Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 7, let's turn to Romans chapter 7, um, verse, verse 21. To 24 Romans chapter 7 verses 21 to 24 let's read it together I find then a law that evil is present with me the one who wills to do good for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Yes, of course, we are God's children with our salvation. No problem. And Jesus died for us and solved the sin problem. And we don't have to worry about our sin anymore. That part is done. But, you know, we still have sinful nature. That's why Apostle Paul said, I find then a law that evil is present with me. Still, I have a sinful nature. The one who wills to do good. Um, I want to do good, but still this evil is also with me. The two laws are fighting against each other. One, the law of you know, this evil and sin, which is in our body. Because in verse 23, uh, at the end, the law of sin which is in my members. Members means the members of my body. You know, my members still wants, like I want to, I want to watch something interesting. I want to eat something uh, 
uh, yummy, tasty, and I want to enjoy, you know, all these things. The pleasure. I want pleasure. Right? Like that. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? A king adopted a beggar as his son. The beggar has become a, a prince right away, legally, no problem. But this beggar still have, this beggar turned to prince, still has this uh, beggar nature, right? Of course, uh, after some time, he'll become more and more like a prince. He will learn how to behave, how all the manners of the king as a prince. But until then, you know, he still acts like a beggar, uh, like uh, going for the food on the floor. And then the, um, it takes time, basically. But legally, he's a prince. Even though he acts like a beggar, it doesn't matter. He's a prince, it's just like that. And our hope, is this when Jesus comes again we will be like him actually right first John chapter 3 first John chapter 3 verse 23 first John chapter 3 verses 23 let's read it together beloved now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when, we, when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Him purify himself, just as He is pure. We know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him. Isn't it wonderful? We shall be like a Jesus Christ when, when He is revealed, when Jesus comes again, when He transforms our lowly body into glorious body. That is our hope. So that's why Second uh, Corinthians chapter five verse four: For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed. What does that mean? What we hope is not just getting rid of this sinful body. Because we have sinful nature in our body, we might th think that, oh, I don't want this body unclothed. No, not only that one. We want to be clothed. That's our real hope. Okay? It's not like uh, we just uh, will remove our sinful body and we don't have to sin anymore. We go further. We will be clothed with this glorious body and will become like Jesus Christ. This is our true hope, right? Let's turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Let's read it together. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. Our citizenship is in heaven. We belong to heaven. That's our home. But we are still living here. That's the problem. But Remember and know that we will be transformed. Our lowly body will be transformed into His glorious body. Actually, um, I would call this moment uh, when our body is transformed to the glorious body, this is the death of death. The sin and death will be conquered com completely. Okay, there will be no more sin because our sinful body will be destroyed. There will be no more death because the glorious body we'll have on later will never die, right? The death of death. That is our true hope. And that's why let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Let me read 
from verse 51. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Death is swallowed up in victory. Verse 55, let's read it together. O death, O Hades, where is your victory? The death, you are dead now. You know, Hades, you are dead. Where is your victory? Verse 56, the sting of death is a sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Verse 57, let's read it together. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have a victory over sin and death. That's why, let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4. Uh, verse 4, the end of verse 4, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. The mortality, the death will be swallowed up by life. The death came to this world, killing so many people. But now, this mortality, the death will be swallowed up by life of Jesus Christ. There will be no more death. The death of death. That is our hope, right? Verse 5. Now he, has, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. God has prepared everything for us. Regarding our salvation, the Trinity God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, all work together, actually. God the Father has planned about our salvation from the beginning, from the foundation of the world. That's what God the Father did. And God the Son, Jesus Christ, came to achieve, to fulfill the salvation by dying on the cross. And now, the Holy Spirit, God the Spirit, has become the guarantee for our salvation. It is the Holy Spirit who helps us to believe, actually. How can you believe that, you know, you haven't seen Jesus Christ, but how could you come to believe that Jesus died for you? It is the, through the help of the Holy Spirit, because He has become a guarantee of the Spirit. You know guarantee? Suppose you are buying a building. So at the time of signing the contract, you give some kind of down payment, the initial payment. That is the guarantee, actually. That shows clearly you will buy that building, right? So just like that, the Holy Spirit has become guarantee for our salvation. The Holy Spirit gives us assurance of salvation. The Holy Spirit uh, strengthens our faith more and more. He is our guarantee. And that's why, verse 6, so we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. We will be joining our Lord soon. But while we are living in this world, we are absent from the Lord. Verse 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Verse 8, let's read it together. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. What does that mean? We are confident. What? We are living in this world now and we are absent from the Lord for a while, actually. Okay? We haven't joined our Lord Jesus in heaven. But when Jesus comes again, we'll be joining Him. How do we know? Through faith. Through faith. 
Do you know we see everything through faith, with faith? We walk not by sight, but by faith. Do you know that we can see everything because of the light? light. Without light, we cannot see anything. Right? Faith is just like the light. With the faith, we can see all these spiritual things. When we were saved, the light has come to your, come into our heart, right? First Corinthians. First Corinthians. Ah, uh, Second Corinthians, chapter four, verse six. Uh, the previous chapter, chapter four, verse six. Let's read it together. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Jesus came as the light so that we can see everything clearly. So we walk by faith, not by sight. Okay? The face, through faith we can see everything. Even though the heaven is not visible, we can see that with our faith. Okay, and that's what happened to Moses, uh, Abraham actually, and Moses, right? Let's turn to Hebrew chapter eleven. Hebrew chapter eleven, verse nine. Hebrew chapter eleven, verse nine. This is about Abraham. Verse nine. Hebrew chapter eleven, verse nine. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country. Dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Verse 10, let's read it together. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Even though Abraham was rich, he was living in the tent. Why? He didn't care about the house he lives in this world. Verse 10, he waited for the city which has foundation. The city is not visible, but he could see it through faith, right? Also, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27. Verse 27. Let's read it together. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Moses, he saw God who is invisible. How? Through faith. Right? That's the key. That's the key. Second Corinthians chapter four verse eighteen. Second Corinthians chapter four verse eighteen. Let's read it together. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Yes. There are eternal world which are not seen. But we can see that. We can see that. How? By faith. And that's why verse 8, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Yes, I'm qu confident, I'm quite sure that I will be present with the Lord when he appears. Okay. Let's see. You know, this is the difference between the unbeliever and the truly born again Christians. We have this hope, right? In the beginning I told you the sin and death. They are the two things which humans cannot conquer even now, you know. We are absolutely powerless with sin and death. There's no way we can overcome them. We can conquer them. No way. That's why Jesus came and conquered sin and death. Oh, death, where is your sting? Now we are, we have a victory over sin and death through Jesus Christ. And we know that someday, you know, even this earthly tent earthly house will be destroyed and we'll have this eternal body and we'll be we'll have this glorious body excellent body amazing body 
and we'll be praising God in heaven forever and ever. We are confident that we'll be present with the Lord soon, actually. No, Jesus might come anytime. So let's thank God because we are living in this age when Jesus, when Jesus comes, we'll be raptured and we'll see Jesus our Lord without death, without dying. Right? So many Christians were longing. They, they had hoped to, to see Jesus when Jesus comes again, but they died. Of course, they'll be resurrected before we are transformed. But for us, just like Enoch, you know, we'll be just caught up to heaven and we'll see Jesus face to face. And that's why Apostle Paul, you know, he, hath, he was full of joy and gladness because of this promise. And let's remember this promise. And uh, that's the difference between this. You know, those who are perishing and those we who are born again, we have this eternal hope, and that's why we are always rejoice, and we are longing to be present with the Lord. Let's pray together. Our Lord, thank you so much for giving us this eternal hope of being present with you in heaven, Lord. We haven't done anything but sin and we don't deserve this grace but you loved us so much that you gave your only son Jesus Christ so that all our sins are forgiven and you made us your children so Lord help us to remember all these promises again and again so that we are not discouraged but we live by faith and Lord we want to pay back your love and your grace in our life. So give us a chance to preach the gospel to others who are still in darkness and lost so that you know, we can share this good news and they can become your children like us. And uh, when the kingdom, your kingdom expands more and more, we know that's how we can glorify you. So Lord, give us a chance to preach the gospel more in coming days. Thank you so much for this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.